Okay. Uh, welcome to another Robotics Institute seminar. I'm not your permanent announcer, uh, just a coincidence two weeks in a row. Um, let's see, something really uh, remarkable has happened over the last year, which is that uh, Disney decided to locate a research laboratory in uh, Pittsburgh to be uh, close to us. And uh, this is the first time we've ever had a speaker from Disney Research Pittsburgh in the RI seminar, but I think it will be the first of many. The, um, the researchers at Disney Research Pittsburgh, uh, we really want to view them as part of our community. Uh, it's a way to make the local research community effectively larger than what we would be able to host at the university. And at the same time, it brings a really uh, fun uh, new perspective to our uh, research. Uh, I can tell you when I visited uh, Anaheim uh, with Jessica Hodgins uh, the first time, uh, it was a real thrill to, to hang out with the Disney people. So uh, it's pretty exciting they're going to be here with us. Uh, many of them, uh, many or if not all, are adjunct faculty. So uh, you know we can collaborate with them. Students can be advised by them. Uh, exactly as if uh, they were formerly part of Carnegie Mellon. And uh, in fact, they, they really are part of the Robotics Institute. So uh, today, we're uh, welcoming Katsu Yamane. Uh, many of you uh, probably knew Katsu already. He was here as a, on a postdoc uh, several years ago, um, from uh, 2002 to 2003. Uh, before that, he got his uh, all his degrees at the University of Tokyo, and following his postdoc, he was uh, a professor, an assistant or associate professor at the University of Tokyo, and then he just uh, joined us this fall, and uh, it's a, a thrill to have him here, so uh, welcome. Thank you, Matt. Um, my name is Katsuya Mane. Um, I just joined Disney Research Pittsburgh last October, and uh, I'm really honored to be here, and uh, thank you for coming, especially in this weather. So um, I'd like to start my talk, which is the title is uh, Towards Robots That Move and Interact Like Humans. So most of the contents will be the work I, I've done at uh, my student, as my uh, as student, uh, as a postdoc here, and as a faculty at University of Tokyo. And I'll also uh, talk a little bit about uh, what we're going to use robots in Disney. So a little bit of my background. So um, as Matt introduced, I got the uh, degree at the University of Tokyo. Um, then I came here as a postdoc uh, for one year. I, I worked with Jessica Hodges on using motion capture data for graphics uh, and uh, humanoid robots. And then I uh, went back to the University of Tokyo as a faculty member. And uh, there I started a work on uh, modeling human and understanding how human control the body. And um, finally, I came, to, came back again to Pittsburgh as a uh, researcher at Disney Research Pittsburgh. Okay, so um, this is uh, just um, a map of my research area. So I work in the uh, intersection of robotics, uh, graphics, and biomechanics. I'm not going to uh, talk uh, everything today, of course. Uh, but um, the main research interest is in um, the question, how do we human coordinate our motion? So human is a pretty amazing creature. Well, all creatures are kind of amazing, but um, human is especially amazing because we can coordinate our motion in a very, in a very uh, fine way. So there are uh, a lot of issues to deal with to do kind of, uh, this kind of research. The first one is how to model our body itself. So it's, it's not trivial. Um, our body is very complex. Um, building a very precise model usually results in a very uh, computationally expensive model so that's uh, not even easy to handle in today's computer. Um, then uh, we also need some algorithms for analyzing and simulating its motion. And because we are also uh, dealing with human, we have uh, you, we need a way to measure human motion or human uh, activity in uh, various ways. So mocap is, of course, one of those, but that's just one. We also have to measure the force uh, interacting with the environment. 
uh, we might want to have uh, muscle activity information using el electromyography. And we might also want to uh, measure uh, brain activity, like uh, using devices like uh, fMRI. And another issue is that um, it's very difficult to identify the parameters of human model. So you can't uh, cut the living human apart and measure that mass, right? So um, we need to have some uh, indirect way to measure, uh, identify its parameter. And application is quite broad. Uh, we could think of this as a way to come up with a nice controller for robotics. Um, also in graphics, graphics inherently uh, handles human character. So that's also a way to control virtual characters in uh, animation. Um, in sports science, uh, it's also important because we can understand human motion so that we can improve the performance of athletes, for example. And in, in medical science, there are a lot of uh, diseases that causes problems in motion coordination. So we could uh, develop some nice ways to rehab for rehabilitation or um, um, taking care of that kind of diseases. So um, then a little bit about Disney research. So what is Disney research? This is a, um, quite, uh, we do have a um, web page, so you can look at it. But right now, it's quite boring. It just has a one page summary of the lab. Uh, re Disney research is really an informal group of uh, research labs uh, throughout the Walt Disney Company. So it includes various um, labs uh, from um, all uh, business units of uh, Disney Company. And it includes, of course, Disney Research Pittsburgh. We have another similar la lab in Zurich. And also, of course, uh, Walt Disney Imagineering has been a uh, main part of Disney doing research and development. And, the, and there are al also other uh, groups in animation, for example. Um, Disney Research Pittsburgh uh, just started last year. Uh, director is, of course, Jessica Hodgins, uh, all of you know. And uh, we currently have two senior research scientists. One, uh, I'm one of them, and one postdoc. And we have uh, other uh, uh, administrative coordinator. And we also have uh, a visiting professor uh, from Georgia Tech and two interns, uh, two uh, of his students as interns. We are um, trying to have seven to eight senior research scientists in the end. Um, so the uh, areas covered will be quite broad. Uh, I'm working on robotics. One of the uh, research scientists is working on animation, especially, especially in face animation. Um, the uh, visiting professor from Georgia Tech is working on sport visualization for ESPN. Um, there will be some people for uh, interfaces, machine learning, and also some wireless technologies. And the location is just, uh, just across Forbes. So you can um, come by, stop by any time you want. So um, when I decided to leave Tokyo and join Disney Research, uh, I was asked, why Disney, uh, a lot of times. So um, I want to explain that here. Um, so the re main reason is that um, probably Disney owns largest number of humanoid robots uh, among all companies, which are directly used in their business. So there are a lot of uh, companies now that use robots for like advertisements or uh, just for promotion. But uh, the robots in Disney is uh, directly related to the business in the parks, for example. Um, the other thing is that human shape is requ required for a robot. So there is a long debate in robotics that if a robot has to be human shape. And uh, the point of not having human shape is that it's much more efficient if you design a robot tailored for a specific task. The point for having human shape is that the, our environment here is mostly built for human shape. So that would be uh, uh, enable uh, robots for general purpose. So there is a long debate, and I think it, it's it's not um, it hasn't come to a conclusion yet. But for Disney, uh, robots has to be human shape. We don't want to see wheeled Mickey Mouse or anything like that, right? So um, the robots here has to be human shape. So that's exciting. We don't have the debate. Um, so and the other thing is that we have. 
uh, various environments to test our ro robots, from very controlled environment like in um, rides or shows, or to very um, complex environment like outdoor in the parks. So we can have choose any of those environments to test our robots. And um, another exciting uh, aspect of Disney is that it has a lot of, a lot of different business units. Um, so, so that will allow um, other possible collaborations uh, in various areas. So like animation, we also, uh, of course, have Disney Animation and Pixar. Uh, game, um, IMD is a game company uh, which uh, frequently use motion capture. Um, there is also a division for consumer products and their uh, toys right now. Uh, there are a lot of robots as toys right now, so there is also some possibility there. And as, as I said, uh, there is a uh, great demand in uh, sport visualization through ESPN, and uh, Disney also owns ABC. And, um, of course, great RI, Robotics Institute is here, so um, I was very thrilled. Uh, when Disney was uh, trying to collaborate with uh, Robotics Institute here. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk uh, basically about these three uh, topics. So the first one is uh, nothing related to human motion, but um, I spent a pretty long time uh, developing some efficient numerical tools for graphics and robots. So I'll first talk about that. And then, um, uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, adapting human motion. In this case, I just took motion capture data as a reference and tried to use that data to uh, generate uh, motions for characters and robots. And uh, finally, I will under, uh, uh, talk about our uh, model, human model and simulation tool, which is will be used for uh, understanding human motion control. So I'll start from uh, new efficient num numerical tools. Um, so this is a kind of, um, so this axis is the number of bodies in the ar articulated uh, body, so uh, basically a robot. So um, 20 or 30 years ago, most of the uh, robots had only a few degrees of freedom. So um, it was hard for that the computers that time, but it's fairly easy to compute the dynamics of this kind of robot now. And like uh, human robots has uh, typically has 20 or 30 degrees of freedom, uh, which is uh, used to be quite hard 10 years ago, but now it's pretty simple, easy to compute very fast. And then uh, there comes the human model. So if you only consider the skeleton, it will have 100 or 200 degrees of freedom. And uh, this will be a little bit computationally uh, demanding. And if, if we also consider the muscles as well, the number goes to almost to uh, 1,000. And this will be uh, quite difficult to handle. And above that, we uh, still have some very complex systems like molecules where we might have uh, a millions of um, bodies in the system. So um, there is a long way to go. So I worked on uh, a couple of projects to develop humanoid simulators with uh, AISD, which is a national research institute in Japan. And um, we actually uh, developed a software called OpenHRP. And uh, OpenHRP uh, version 3 is the latest version. And this is actually open source. You can, so you can go to this website and download uh, the source code for free. So um, when we want to simulate humanoid motions, there are uh, several different requirements for the simulator. So it has, of course, have to um, handle articulated rigid bodies rather than just having independent rigid bodies flying around. And we also uh, need some collision and contact models. And we also want to uh, handle general polygonal objects rather than just um, uh, uh, cubes. And um, we really concern about the preci precision of the simulation. Um, 
it, of course, it has to be visually plausible. But not only that, uh, the results should also be per, uh, physically precise. And um, for the uh, efficiency issues, uh, the, the algorithm, of course, has to be numerically uh, stable and uh, efficient as uh, possible. So, um, so this is almost the fir uh, first research work I did uh, when I was a PhD student. So in this case, I um, focused on how to handle the change of chain, kinematic chain, while the uh, humanoid release or grasp some objects. So uh, you can see that the robot can uh, release the bar and eventually fall down. So this simulation can be done um, very interactively. So you can just specify the time of release. And all the software will handle all the uh, uh, problems related to having different models for different grasp. Um, so, but the problem was that the, uh, the algorithm was not quite scalable. So it required a square of number of uh, joints to compute the whole simulation. So um, to deal with that problem, one way is to decrease the complexity. So there are a lot of algorithms that can compute the forward dynamics in linear time, linear to the number of joints. And the other way is to employ parallel processing. So by that way, we can uh, reduce the complexity uh, to log n of the uh, number of pr uh, joints. So um, we also developed a new our or original algorithm for that. So this can handle any open or closed kinematic chains. Uh, this can compute it in parallel. And we also have a way to schedule the parallel processing automatically. But it actually turns out that um, we started from uh, different equations. But eventually, we can show that this result is actually equivalent to the Featherstone's uh, 1999 algorithm. So um, we started from different uh, equations, but eventually came to the same point. But well, it's it's quite natural because we are handling the same problem. What do you mean by open or closed kinematic chain? Um, so open chain is a chain uh, a structure that doesn't have any closed loop. So you can uh, like branched. So human or branch, but doesn't have any closed loop. But once human stands on the ground, you will have some loop here. If you grab something, you will have some loop here. So that's closed chain. And um, actually, uh, this is, these algorithms are quite efficient. So I tested up to 3,200 joint uh, structure. But the, the computation time is still tens of milliseconds or kind of that order. order. So quite efficient. And uh, our algorithm can handle closed chain, as I said, and also can be computed in parallel. <coughs> and if I apply this to uh, human models, it's also uh, quite fast. So even for this uh, very complex uh, human model with 161 degrees of freedom, uh, the computation time, if we have uh, four cores, um, no, in this case, uh, yeah, for cores, the computation time is much uh, shorter than one millisecond. So this is this can compute it quite in, uh, quite in real time. And then um, I then look at looked at uh, collision and contact models. So there are uh, different, uh, uh, basically three different approaches for collision and contact models. So the uh, very easy one is spring damper model or penalty-based model. So uh, you can assume some spring and damper at the contact point and assume that those spring and damper uh, exerts uh, contact force to push the object back to the air. Um, this is quite easy to implement. But uh, if you have experience in this kind of simulation, you will spend a lot of time uh, tuning the spring and damper parameters. So it's, it's quite hard to get. Um, uh, good results for uh, all simulation scenarios. The other way is to uh, is a uh, rigid body model or constraint based model. So this uh, model uh, explicitly says that the uh, object should stay on the uh, on the other object and computes the force uh, required to maintain that constraint. 
And this is uh, relatively precise in theory and also numerically stable in theory. But um, if you uh, use any uh, free libraries that are uh, hanging around, uh, you will find that um, very few existing libraries actually work for humanoid robots with general uh, shape and uh, in 3D and that kind of uh, very complex uh, scene. So the implementation is very difficult. Uh, the last one is impulse space model, uh, which is also a numerical stable. But um, so this handles collision and contacts as a, uh, uh, a sequential collision, small collisions. So um, it's not quite good for uh, continuous contact, like just standing on the ground. So um, so so uh, we had to uh, develop some new algorithm for contact handling. So we first decided to take this rigid body model. So in rigid body model, uh, the uh, constraints are usually expressed as a linear comp complementarity problem, or LCP. So uh, the, this constraint is that uh, the velocity and force should lie on, on this uh, line. So if the velocity is uh, positive, meaning that the uh, this ball is uh, going upwards, so uh, going apart of this floor, then the force should be zero. And if the velocity is zero, meaning that the ball is staying on the floor, then there must be some positive force. So uh, there is uh, this kind of constraint uh, for the contact problem. The problem is that uh, how to find a solution on this line. So um, there are a couple of approaches for solving LCP. And as I said, um, it's, it's actually quite hard to implement those algorithms. So uh, we had to come up with a new uh, algorithm to uh, solve LCPs. And it's actually an uh, um, extension or improvement of classical algorithm for uh, solving, solving LCP. I'm not going into details for this part. And uh, combine that collision, uh, I mean, uh, LCP solver with uh, collision formulation, uh, which is an ex extension of prior work to uh, articulated rigid bodies, and combine that with the uh, forward dynamics algorithm we developed before. So um, this is just an example of simulation. Um, this is a small humanoid robot developed in our group at Tokyo. and. Um, this is actually playing tap dancing. I don't have the music here, unfortunately, but uh, uh, you can imagine any kind of music here. And here are some stats for that simulation. So as you can see, our algorithm doesn't fail at all. And also, um, interestingly, the uh, time for solving LCP itself is uh, half of a uh, standard algorithm. And um, this is actually a comparison with experiment. So this is a, the same simulation uh, as before. And this is the uh, uh, replay of that, uh, this reference motion on a real humanoid robot. So as you can see, um, I think most of the uh, macroscopic motion is cap uh, realized in this simulation as well, like the rotation around the yaw axis. Yes? Do you also have friction in this model? Mm -hmm. Um, it's it's a um, Coulomb friction, but it, it um, well uh, the uh, the difference is that it can only uh, consider uh, one friction friction coefficient, so a little bit um, uh, a little bit of simpli uh, simplified version of Coulomb friction. And this is another example where we replace the foot link with a special foot structure with a toe joint. And the toe part is actually a closed chain. So this is a uh, parallel four bar linkage here to uh, create a one uh, degree of freedom at the toe. And um, 
course, there are also some other non-humanoid examples. Uh, but I uh, also stick to uh, articulated rigid body examples. So all of these strings are modeled as a uh, um, several chain. Okay. Um, that was a dynamic simulation, uh, mainly for humanoids. And um, this is a work for uh, graphics, actually. Uh, I worked with Sega to develop some um, intuitive tool for generating um, animations. And in this work, I developed some uh, algorithm for, uh, that allows animators to intuitively manipulate a character and uh, generate natural poster by just dragging one of the links uh, in the character. So this is the idea. So you uh, pin some of the joints or, or uh, some of the links in the uh, model and you drag uh, other link. And you can generate this kind of a very natural uh, posture after the drag. So um, this is not trying to uh, generate a whole sequence of motion automatically. But this is more intended to provide animators with an intuitive interface for manipulating characters. And in this work, I try to um, attach any number of constraints, allow any number of constraints, like, of course, link position or orientation. Uh, this can also give reference joint angles, uh, or you can specify some motion range for each joint. And the problem here is, of course, singularity. And also, there might be some inconsistent constraints. So within, for example, within the given motion range, you can't really reach that point, that kind of inconsistencies. So the solution here is to use uh, uh, a special inverse called singularity robust inverse. And I also uh, divided the constraints into two priority levels, uh, the higher one being the constraints that must be uh, satisfied and the other ones being uh, the constraints that um, does not necessarily have to be uh, satisfied, but if possible, uh, they can be satisfied. And this uh, actually became a commercial soft software called Animanium, and uh, this is also uh, used for uh, motion capture, uh, converting motion capture data to joint angles. Um, this is a demo movie for Animanium. So as you can see, the mouse is actually specifying the motion of the blue link, uh, I mean, uh, the red link. <laughs> and this is actually a sequence of motion created by using this interface, so specifying a number of keyframes using this interface. Okay, <coughs> um, part one is finished. Um, I think I'm gonna have to speed up. So um, the second topic is about adapting human motion. So uh, motion capture data is just an instance of human motion. And that can't be applied to a different uh, robot or different character or a different environment or different constraints. So we want to um, be able to convert original motion capture data to fit to a new model or constraints. Right. So. <coughs> To deal with different kinematics or dynamics, um, because of the physical uh, difference in dynamics parameters, the original motion capture data might not be feasible for the robot or uh, the new character. Or because of the difference in kinematics, uh, the intended task might not be achievable for a different character. Like uh, with shorter arm, you can't really reach the object with the same joint angles. Um, it is also difficult to distinguish between what can be modified and what has to be uh, preserved. So is the joint trajectory important or rather than the end of, or the end factor is more important? Or sometimes the contact force might be the most important factor to accomplishing that task. And this is usually uh, task dependent. So uh, usually the designer has to decide what has to be uh, preserved and what can be modified. And um, some other interesting uh, 
problem is that human is very good at adap adapting other person's motion to uh, own body, right? Um, so we can observe other person's motion and um, instantly adapt that motion to uh, the body itself. So um, sometimes it does require practice. But once acquired, uh, it's, it's quite ro robust. We can apply that to a very different environment or different constraints. So um, this is a very interesting problem and has been uh, studied in both robotics and graphics. And uh, usually this is formulated as some kind of optimiz optimization problem eventually. For the synthesis, sp synthesis part, there are work on uh, mathematical optimization. Uh, some uh, people, including Chris Atkinson here, uh, tries to learn uh, a motion uh, using real hardware. And there are also, also analysis side. So take a bunch of human motion and uh, analyze where we, they can be stitched to make new sequence of motion. And of course, there are some work on studying human, uh, what is uh, happening in the human motor control. So I'm going to talk uh, briefly about three different adapt ad adaptation techniques I uh, worked on. So um, the first one is dynamic filter. Uh, this is already quite uh, old work. But um, in this case, uh, it does consider uh, full dynamics, but it can only handle slightly different kinematic, uh, different model from uh, the original motion capture subject. Uh, the second one is actually done here with James Kaufner and Jessica, um, is to synthesize new manipulation tasks uh, out of very uh, small database. And this can handle very different environments and characters by using uh, inverse kinematics and planning algorithms. But uh, it doesn't actually consider the dynamics. So the motion has to be quasi-static. And the last one is uh, the uh, actually using real hardware, which is motorized Marionet, uh, which is the uh, um, automated version of uh, Marionet. And um, the, the problem here is that the Marionet tends to have very limited mobility compared to human and very different actuation mechanisms. So uh, this uh, problem has to uh, be solved to generate uh, motions of motorized Marionet out of human motion. OK, so uh, about the dynamics filter, what is this? So it is a filter that converts a physically infeasible motion to a feasible one. So this is a very s simple example. So let's say uh, this, th this, uh, the root joint, the upper joint, is free. Uh, and the second joint, only the second joint is, is actuated. And you can uh, kinematically generate this kind of, uh, any, any kind of motion. So you can specify the first one as the uh, first keyframe, and uh, this last one as uh, uh, another keyframe. And if you simply inter interpolate between these two keyframes, you will get this kind of motion, which is obviously physically infeasible. Because the first joint is free, it can't stay fixed, right? So um, this is not feasible, dynamically feasible for this robot. So what the um, so dynamics filter takes this uh, infeas infeasible motion and outputs something like this, where the uh, first joint also rotates a little bit to keep that uh, everything balanced throughout the sequence. So that's what uh, dyna dynamics filter does. But it does respect the original input, uh, the original angle of the second joint. So um, this filter can handle uh, some inconsistency in the data. For example, there might be some small measurement error in the uh, original motion capture data, or there might be some small difference in the kinematic or dynamic parameters. And uh, the, uh, the motion might be edited manually from original, like uh, connecting two different motions into a, a single sequence. And that could cause some infeasibility because the connect connection doesn't consider the dynamics. So, um, well, yeah, let's go straight to the results. So um, I hope you can see this. Uh, so the, uh, the one in the right is the original motion capture data. And the one in the left is a filtered motion. And if you closely look at the feet of these both uh, t two sequences, you will notice a difference. 
So for the original motion capture, the, the feet is kind of floating uh, above the floor and also slipping a little bit because of the, of the difference in the kinematics. But for the uh, filtered one, you'll notice that feet is always flat on the ground and doesn't slip. And um, the one is the uh, left bottom is uh, an example of manual editing of original motion capture. So in this case, I just uh, modified the tra trajectory of the hip uh, hip joint to make a uh, a slight right turn out of the uh, s the same walking motion capture data, which doesn't, of course, consider the uh, effect by uh, cause uh, effect caused by the turn, but it can also be filtered by um, filtered and converted to a physically feasible motion uh, for uh, this character. And uh, in this case, I changed the mass of uh, the uh, right hand to uh, make it uh, something like carrying a heavy object. So you'll no notice that this motion is quite different from the original motion capture. Okay. So um, the next one is synthesizing manipulation tasks. Um, so suppose we got this kind of uh, simple manipulation example for a motion capture. And what we want to do is to apply this uh, example to a very different character like Gorilla uh, and to a very different uh, environment or task. So um, here I applied uh, motion planning algorithm and inverse kinematics to uh, deal with that kind of problem. And we, uh, the feature of our work is that it can be done with a very small data set. In this case, we only use four pick and place examples and generate a wide variety of uh, motions. So we use uh, motion planning techniques to um, ensures that the object and the character doesn't collide with the environment. And this is just a simple manipulation task. But by combining, uh, connecting uh, several of these, we can generate this kind of uh, cooperative motion as well. And um, so the idea of motion capture is that inverse kinematics doesn't always result in natural posture. Because it's a numerical method, it doesn't uh, take the uh, human uh, body character um, into account. So um, it can result in very unnatural uh, posture. But by using motion capture data, we can bias that, uh, uh, bias inverse kinematics towards more natural posture. And this is using that feature uh, uh, more in, in the sense that it tries to control the way the character uh, carries the object. So this, in this case, we use this kind of examples where the, uh, the subject is bending the uh, back. So you, you're not going to use this strategy for a heavy object, but it might be good for a lighter object. So this is a result uh, we got from this example. But if we change the example like this, where uh, the subject is bending the knee instead of the back. Um, the resulting motion changes and uh, it, it uses different uh, strategy for lifting. Okay. And then um, the third one is adapting uh, human motion again to a very different uh, mechanism. In this case, motorized marionette. And we take this kind of uh, uh, human motion and try to apply this to uh, uh, this marionette. And um, so the problem here is that it's very, uh, the actuation system is very different. And it also has a very limited mobility. So um, I used inverse kinematics again to limit the motion range of, of the uh, marionette model. And, uh, the problem of actuation is that it tends to um, 
uh, swing back and forth because only the upper part of the uh, uh, string is actuated. So we have to cancel out this swing using some uh, controller. Cock robin. I said the sparrow. So this is uh, just one example. Uh, cock robin. Who saw him die? I think it's I some kind of nursery tale and I saw him uh, performed by an uh, actor. Who caught his blood? Ah, cock robin. I said the sparrow with my little bow and arrow. So you can I killed cock robin. Reasonably imitate uh, that human motion uh, with this very different and simple robot. Okay, um, so the last part is about understanding human motion control. And um, I think this is a key for interactive robots because uh, using human uh, control strategy, we could improve the robustness of control, especially for humanoid robots, where um, it has to keep balance all the time. Um, in human, uh, it is believed that we have a hierarchy of controllers at the higher level, which acts in the brain, um, it does a higher level planning, basically. And it has, it has very large delay. So it is natural to think that it's too slow to cope with sudden disturbances. So there, there must be a much simpler uh, part, which is uh, lower level reflex control, in which happens actually in the spinal cord. So it doesn't go up to the brain. So it's very fast. And uh, it, it uses a bunch of different sensors to um, cause the uh, reflex, and it has a very small delay compared to the uh, higher level decision making. But it, it's still quite slow compared to, for example, humanoid controller, which usually runs at uh, one kilohertz or so. So um, there must be some uh, very sophisticated mechanism, mechanism in, in, the, in the human body. So our goal is to understand what that is. So we de uh, developed uh, some very detailed a uh, human model, which consists of the, uh, the skeleton with 155 degrees of freedom and almost 1,000 muscles. And on, to on top of that, we also uh, developed some um, reflex, reflex model. Of course, we are not able to model the brain, but we can uh, have a reasonably detailed model of the uh, uh, network in the spine and the, and the, and, and the, and the muscle. So uh, this is a skeleton model. And um, we have the uh, actuation model with almost 1,000 muscles. And we also have the algorithms to analyze and uh, simulate its motion. And the muscles are quite standard model in biomechanics. It's, it, it is just a mass less and uh, uh, wire. But it, it does have uh, some features like um, this via point where the muscle can uh, slide back and forth without friction. And um, so to connect this model with conventional robot model, uh, we have this actuation model where we can, by, by which we can convert muscle tension to uh, joint torque. And this is a very uh, simple linear map. <coughs> and we formulate some optimiz optimization function to do the inverse dynamics, where we know the motion of the model by motion capture, for example. And uh, we can estimate the muscle tension uh, that uh, makes that motion. To do that, we have to do the uh, inverse mapping from joint torque to uh, muscle tensions. But because we have 1,000 muscles for to drive 155 degrees of freedom, it's quite a redundant system. So we need to formulate some optimization to find a unique solution for that problem. And um, so the, one of the features of, of our algorithms that is that we can consider uh, actual muscle activity obtained from EMG electro electromyography data. So we can uh, bias the uh, optimization by putting some uh, reference force computed from uh, the EMG data to obtain more physiologically realistic muscle tension estimation. So here are just a couple of examples. So we, this um, is a toe walk, not a natural walk, but uh, so the color of the muscle indicates the uh, tension of the muscle. So red muscles are exerting more forces than the yellow ones.
And the red arrow uh, from the floor is the uh, ground contact force. This is also estimated. Um, okay. So, um, so that's the mus musculoskeletal model. And we want to add some uh, uh, model of the uh, neuro, um, neuromuscular network model. So, um, so inputs and outputs of this model are as, as follows. So um, the input is the uh, uh, command signal from the spine, which comes out of the spine and uh, goes down to the muscles. And uh, the model is supposed to output the muscle tensions to drive this uh, skeleton. And um, there are basically two uh, directions that signals uh, go. So the one is from brain to the muscles, and the other one is muscles uh, to muscles via the spine. So this is actually the reflex uh, loop. And um, so to build this model, we somehow have to estimate the signal coming from the brain, uh, coming uh, from the root of the red arrow. But of course, it's impossible to actually insert some needle to the, your spine. So um, we have to estimate that. So the way we did this uh, this time was to use some statistical method to estimate the independent signals that cause the muscle tension signals. And it was quite interesting because, uh, so what this does is that it, it is basically a dimension re reaction. And actually, it turns out that 120 dimensional signal is enough to generate the 1,000 dimensional signal, I mean, uh, which is the muscle tension. So. Um, even with 120 dimension uh, signal, we can reconstruct the muscle tension with only 5% of error. And um, this actually happens to be uh, the number of branches coming out of the spine. So we, we decided to use this as a signal coming out of the spine. So we have estimated the signal coming from this side, which is the input. And we already know the output, which is a muscle tension through inverse dynamics. So um, Using this, you can uh, train that model. This is basically a neural network model. So uh, you can basically train the weights at each neurons. Um, so this shows actually a very interesting property where the uh, reflex loop actually, uh, the weight of the reflex loop um, actually is consistent with the function of the muscles. So in this case, um, these uh, muscles in the blue columns are uh, categorized as the agonist muscle, so work together with a muscle called iliacus. And um, actually, the, the weight of the reflect loop are, are all positive. So this means that uh, input uh, from the iliacus uh, works in a positive uh, feedback to th those muscles. But on the other hand, the muscles uh, which are antagonist muscles, which works in the opposite direction, has negative um, uh, weights. So this means that acti activation that particular muscle prevents the activation of the muscles uh, uh, that works on the opposite direction. So this is very consistent with the bio biological uh, findings. And uh, using this model, we can actually simulate uh, typical reflex and in this case, we simulated the motion of patellar tendon reflex, which is a reflex you typically see when you hit uh, uh, right below your knee. And this is caused by uh, extension of the muscle in your thigh. And, <coughs> and your, your uh, foot usually pops up like this. And this can be also simulated using our model. OK. Um, so uh, to summarize, so I basically talked about three topics. The first one was efficient numerical tools. Uh, the second one was adapting human motion, in this case, motion capture data to real hardware and uh, virtual characters. And finally, I also talked about under, uh, our uh, model uh, developed to understand human motion control. So um, what's next? Uh, especially in terms of robotics in Disney. So um, 
Right now, I'm working on the humanoid robots, improving humanoid robots or animatronic figures in Disney term uh, in parks. And um, so we first want to improve the way we program those robots. So right now, they are quite, um, their motion are quite hand handcrafted. So uh, usually the designer sit in front of the real robot and uh, try to move one joint at a time to get some reasonably good looking motion. So um, first thing we can do is to provide a way to program this kind of robots using, for example, motion capture data. So um, anyone can uh, move in the mocap lab and uh, uh, provide data for that robot. Or we could use data from uh, 3D animation because we already have animation data for some of the robots, uh, I mean, some of the characters. So we could use that data uh, to program a real robot as well. And we also want to realize robust and human-like locomotion for the robots. As you may notice, uh, all of those robots right now are fixed base. Uh, the base might move in a, in, in a way that uh, makes a robot walking in a, some kind of natural way, but uh, it's, it's not actually standing on their feet. So uh, we want to um, build a robot that actually stands on the feet and walk like human, at least in uh, shows or uh, rides where um, the guest is not coming close to the robot. Um, there is also an issue, a kind of recalibration issue. So those robots are in the park for a long time, um, sometimes 20 years. And the, uh, all the actuator and bearings uh, changes uh, during time, and they go out of calibration uh, when they get old. So uh, there must be a way to recalibrate the robot and um, have the same motion as planned, even if the robot gets old. And we also want to add some interactivity in the robots. So right now, they are just replaying uh, pre-programmed uh, motions. But we want to have a, a find a way to uh, make them po able to interact with guests. Um, the other thing is that um, explore new experiences with robots. So, um, so right now there are not so many robots out there, right, in the parks. So um, we could um, put very, uh, small, cheap robots, a number of them, uh, in a bunch of different places in the park. For example, they can entertain guests while they are waiting for the ride in line, or they could be placed in uh, some um, uh, grass field where right now they are just, just grass and trees, but we can put a bunch of small robots there to uh, entertain the guests as well. And we could some, uh, put some robots in the restaurants or stores um, to, yeah, as well, um, entertain the guests in, in um, many occasions. So I think that's almost it. And I'd like to thank our previous and current collaborators. And uh, thank you for listening. questions, uh, I just wanted to pass along the word that there's a post-seminar reception today after the uh, presentation. Is that right? We're at 5. At 5. At 5. And uh, we're all invited, and it's hosted by the Robotics uh, Graduate Students Organization, and uh, they have uh, Mexican-themed uh, consumables there, so it should be fun. Uh, anyway, uh, questions for Katsu? Uh, Unless your goal is enough accuracy, would you consider some set of muscles to consider that will be speed up your simulation? Um, I'm sorry, but uh, would you consider a subset of the muscles uh -huh. that would be maybe more relational efficient? I mean, uh, dividing the model into smaller set muscle sets. More um, yeah, um, maybe uh, for some particular task, it, that's possible. And we are now looking at whole, whole body motion because our interest is there. But for like manipulation, you could just focus on the arm, for example. And that will um, allow you to model that particular part in more detail to in, uh, improve the uh, precision. Does that answer your question? Um, 
So you're building your neuromuscular uh, mm -hmm. model. Do you think that that could be applied to creating more robust controllers for non-humanoid uh, systems, like say a gorilla or something like that? Um, I, I think gorilla is uh, pretty much humanoid, right? right? <laughs> um, yes, um, I think, well, it has to be, of, of course, uh, abstracted in some way, because they don't have exactly the same uh, structure. And uh, of course, the robot is much simpler than human. But I, I believe there is a way to do that. And I, I think we can use this kind of knowledge to improve the robustness of a uh, humanoid controller in general. Yes. No? Um, this is a, a little bit of a technical question. But um, in, in all the inverse kinematics stuff mm -hmm. that, that you discussed, um, First of all, could you explain more about the singularity robust inverse? Mm -hmm. And second, could you uh, describe your methods for dealing with uh, like very hard joint limit constraints? OK. Um, so about the singularity robust inverse. So it's, it's basically an inverse um, uh, with some kind of damping. So basically, you add k times identity matrix and take the inverse so that it doesn't explode. Um, on the uh, joint limit, right now it's, it's just a soft limit. So when it approaches uh, the joint limit, it tries to exert some velocity in the op opposite direction and put, add that as a soft constraint. Um, I think, I believe some people using OpenHRP is trying to simulate manipulation task. Uh, I haven't done by myself, but uh, I think some people are using, actually using OpenHRP to simulate manipulation tasks. Are they successful? Uh, I heard so, yes. I'd be interested in that also. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder, uh, can I ask a question? Sure. Um, you know, karaoke machines sometimes uh, can help people sing better, mm -hmm. or at least it seems like it does. Yeah. And I thought maybe your technology could be used to build a machine that would help people to dance better, or, mm -hmm. or maybe appear to dance better. Is that, uh, have you ever thought about trying to apply it for that? Um, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> um, well, there is actually a work uh, in Tohoku University trying to build a dance partner robot. Uh, it's, it's not biped, uh, it's a mobile base, but um, um, it seems like a cool robot. Yeah. Well, I already feel uh, embarrassed that my partner can dance better than me, so maybe a dancing robot would be helpful. <laughs> Other, uh, other questions? All right, well, thank you very much, Scott.